go ahead and get you started here. Um, since we're, we have a good, good crew and it's a little bit after three. So um, let's see, Leah. Yeah, we're recording. So let me welcome you all to the Claude R. Hocott Lectureship in Petroleum Engineering. We are um, honored today to have Dr. Roseberry Knight from Stanford University to talk to us about using imaging systems for monitoring groundwater. And let me tell you just a little bit about Rosemary and then I'll give her the, give her the floor here. So Rosemary is the George L. Harrington Professor of Earth Sciences at Stanford University and has worked for more than 30 years on the challenge of using geophysical methods to characterize groundwater systems. Her research ranges from careful controlled laboratory experiments to large, large scale field experiments. In 2008, she founded the Center for Groundwater Evaluation and Management. At Stanford, she's taught numerous courses that engage students in service learning by bringing her partnerships into the classroom. She served as department chair, as associate vice provost for graduate education on the she also was on the university budget group for 15 years and was elected chair of the faculty senate. Rosemary has been active within SEG, the Society of Exploration Geophysics, served as second vice president, a distinguished lecturer, and the near surface geophysics honorary lecturer. Within AGU, she is a founding chair of the neo near sorry, <laughs> neo tectonics, huh? near surface geophysics section and has served as associate editor for water resources research in the Journal of Geophysical Research. And I'm just gonna say one or two little uh, personal notes. So I overlap with Rosemary in graduate school at Stanford and um, she actually taught rock physics. I think Amos Noor was on um, sabbatical or he was always on sabbatical. And so Rosemary introduced me to rock physics and, and petrophysics. And then also the, the thing I really marry, re remember about Rosemary is we had a brown bag lecture every week in the geology um, or in the earth sciences school. And she gave a talk with some of her friends of their trip to the Himalayas and talked about going over high passes and said she would take two steps and rest for a minute and then take two more steps and rest for a minute. So anyway, um, without further ado, let me give Rose, Rosemary the, uh, the screen. So welcome Rosemary. Thanks very much, John. And it was actually seven steps and it was my husband and that was the deal we had. I could take seven steps and get a break. So okay. <laughs> uh, anyways, let me share my screen. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's great to be here uh, talking to you about the work we're doing on groundwater systems. So the use of geophysical methods for imaging groundwater systems. I always like to start with our blue planet, the idea that we have tons of water on this planet. And then we realize, oh, only 3% of it is fresh water. And when we think about that fresh water, many of us think about the lakes and the rivers, the reservoirs that we can see on the ground surface. But what I've focused on from my research forever, it seems, is the groundwater, the water that's held in these openings. Now, this is a schematic that I use a lot. The tree is not to scale. We're looking hundreds of meters to thousands of meters below the ground surface. And this is where our groundwater is held in these openings in the rocks and sediments beneath the ground surface. So our groundwater is an essential part of freshwater supply for people and also an essential part of the hydrologic cycle. It basically supports all life on this planet. And we've always thought that there was tons of groundwater down there. And in California in particular, people have tended to rely on a surface water supply and in times of drought, we assume the groundwater is going to be there to pump, kind of like our savings account that we can turn to. But throughout the world, what with climate change and population growth, we are seeing significant declines in the groundwater level, declines that are really raising concerns about the sustainability of groundwater as a freshwater resource. So the critical question people are asking is what can we do to ensure that we can protect the long-term quantity and quality of our groundwater supply? I'm gonna mute for a moment and cough. I'm dealing with allergies here this, uh, these few weeks. So we've got quantity and quality issues. So how do we get the information we need? How do we get the data that we need about these groundwater systems that are hidden from view? Well, wells provide us some information and the drilling of wells give us great information, but 
only at the exact location where we have our wells. And there's so much that we can't figure out just with our well data between the wells or below the wells, especially in California, the wells, water wells tend to be very shallow. So how do we get information deeper in the section? And so that's where geophysics comes along. There is a wide range of possible geophysical methods that we can use. And today I'm going to be focusing primarily on airborne and I'll say a little about satellite methods, but we have geophysical methods that can be deployed on the ground surface and integrated with our well data to fill in between and below where we have these data. A lot of the work that I do with my students is in the Central Valley of California. It's right there, fairly close to Stanford. So a great and convenient field area to have. And this is somewhere where we really need to get our a better handle on the functioning of the groundwater system because it's a groundwater system that's under significant stress. In particular, in the San Joaquin Valley, which is the Southern part of the Central Valley, We've had long-term declines in the groundwater levels and subsequent impact on the land surface because of this. So what I wanna do first of all is to consider the big picture here. Why do we have a groundwater system in trouble? And the reason we have a groundwater system in trouble is the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley in particular is one of the largest agricultural areas in the United States and provides a significant amount of food, not just in California, but throughout the US. And this agriculture is sited in an area that's classified as a desert in the San Joaquin Valley. So a significant amount of water is required for irrigation. And the irrigation of the crops comes from three sources. There can be direct irrigation through precipitation rainfall. There's snow, that's stored in the Sierra Nevadas and then the snow melt is used as a source of irrigation. And if there's not enough water from those two sources, there's the pumping of groundwater. So we've been using satellite data a lot recently and I'm not going to talk about that too much here, but I am going to show some results from working with these satellite data that are really helping us get our head around the big picture and spatial temporal correlations in terms of water supply and water demand. And so I'm going to show you a video here. The data were compiled by Akash Ahmed and the visualization done by Soggy Kang using LeapFrog software. And we've been collaborating with the group at UC Boulder who are providing snowpack data. So here's the Central Valley. And what we can do with the satellite data is get an understanding of the large patterns in terms of water supply and water demand. And the first thing you'll see coming up, these are the results from the TRIM satellite product, which gives us information about precipitation. And this is winter 2016. And the red color is indicating we only have 11 inches of rain over the winter months of 2016 in the southern part of the valley, whereas in the north blue, we have twice that amount. In the Sierras, we see the snowpack data coming up. And again, we have a thicker snowpack in the north than we do in the south. And what this means is when this snowpack melts and the meltwater is delivered throughout the valley through rivers, streams, and irrigation canals, there is much less water available in the south. And the dots coming up here are the size of the reservoirs, the amount of water stored in the reservoirs. So with less surface water in the south, what you're seeing now are the results from my favorite satellite, INSTAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. And what you're seeing is the deformation of the ground surface. Groundwater is being pumped to the extent that the surface is actually declining over time in the San Joaquin Valley due to the extraction of this water. And so what we see in this INSAR data, this is the total subsidence between January 2015 and September 2019. We have close to four and a half feet. The ground levels actually sunk up to 10 meters per year and continuing due to this over extraction of groundwater. So this tells us clearly we have a groundwater system that's under stress. And not only do we have a groundwater system under stress, as a result, we have surface infrastructure under stress. This is starting to impact the very aqueducts that are trying to move water throughout California. 
So what we need to do then, satellite data are fantastic, but in order to see below the ground surface, we really need to be using our geophysical data. And what I've been turning to in many studies recently is this airborne electromagnetic method. And we used it in this study to start understanding the fundamental controls on the subsidence, because we really need to build a detailed model of the subsurface in order to be able to predict and hopefully address the causes of the subsidence. So some simple introduction to the electromagnetic method. So it's a helicopter deployed system so that geophysical instruments are moved across the ground surface at a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The instruments are held about 100 feet, 30 meters off the ground surface. And we're imaging down to a depth of 300 meters, 1,000 feet. So this is a very powerful technology for imaging our groundwater systems. Here is the system. Um, taking off in the Tulare County airfield. This is the large transmitter loop and current is sent through this transmitter loop. This sets up a primary magnetic field that moves below the ground surface, setting up eddy currents that then generate a secondary magnetic field. And it's the response from that secondary magnetic field that's giving us information about the electrical properties of the subsurface that's recorded at the recorder that you see mounted at the back of the transmitter loop. So if I had the audio on, you would hear me go, yoo-hoo, this was my first AEM survey. And I was actually delighted to see everything take off and this airborne EM system head off across the subsidence bowl in uh, the San Joaquin Valley. So what we're mapping out here with our airborne EM data is the electrical resistivity of the subsurface. So the data we get back inverted and we've got this three-dimensional map then of the electrical resistivity of the subsurface. The resolution along the flight line because of the footprint and the stacking you need to do for signal to noise considerations, you can imagine a horizontal resolution of about 30 meters. The vertical resolution because of the physics of the method degrades with depth. So near the surface you can get resolution on the order of a few meters, by the time you're down 500 meters, your resolution, vertical resolution is about 50 meters. So what we want to do is take this image of electrical resistivity and map out sediment type. Groundwater studies aren't particularly interested in electrical resistivity. They want to understand what the materials are that are present. So rock physics, as John mentioned, he learned rock physics from me the year my advisor was on sabbatical at Stanford. And it's always been at the core of much of what I do because I'm absolutely fascinated by how can we measure these properties remotely and extract from that the information we want. And I started out my PhD in a laboratory measuring samples, the size samples. And over the years, I've become how aware, aware of how wrong it is to take our laboratory scale relationships and apply them to chunks of the subsurface that are meters to tens of meters in scale. And all my thoughts of this, I had the opportunity to recently write a book chapter. It's called Field Scale Rock Physics for Near Surface Applications. And it's thinking about how do we conduct those laboratory experiments that we need, but we do it at the field scale. And so a perfect example is the interpretation of airborne EM data, where we need to be coming up with a relationship between electrical resistivity and sediment type that's valid for the spatial heterogeneity below the scale at which we're making our measurement. So what we do is not go back to the laboratory with little samples, but we design an experiment in the field and we say, okay, I'm going to use the lithology logs that are available and shown here, just the gold is my sand and gravel, the green are these mixed zones, the blue is clay. And I'm going to say I have places where I actually have a measurement of what's there from my lithology log. And I've actually done the equivalent of my laboratory experiment. I've measured the electrical resistivity of that sample. And if I go all around my survey area, I'll find lots of places where I have lithology information, and resistivity information. And so all I need to do is model the physics, do the math, and treat this as the perfect laboratory experiment. Right size samples, 
measuring the property that I'm interested in. So we can set this up by thinking about the resistivity that we've measured with our airborne system. And I realize I haven't even introduced the name of the system we're using, it's called SkyTem. So an airborne time domain EM system. And we have a resistivity of the subsurface over some thickness, and we know what the lithology is and the thicknesses. And we're trying to solve for what the resistivities of those units need to be in order to get this resistivity value. And so, as we would do in the lab, we say, well, what's the physics that describes this measurement? And the physics can be well approximated by saying, I've applied an electric field in this direction to this package of materials. You set up an equation linking our unknowns, the resistivity of our components to our knowns, thicknesses, and our SkyTem resistivity measurement. And we set those equations up everywhere where we have these co-located packages of resistivity measured and lithology known. And we come up with this. And when we came up with this, I have to say I was completely thrilled because this is exactly what you would expect. The resistivity along the x-axis. And here's the resistivity values we sound, found for our sand and gravel units. Here's the resistivity we found for our clays and our mixed is in between. And as you would expect, there's not a single resistivity value for sand and gravel because the porosity, the water content of this sand and gravel is varying throughout our study area. Now, one of the things we noted in our first airborne EM study that people had been neglecting, and anyone out there who thinks about electrical resistivity, it would be kind of obvious, the water table in California can be very deep in places, and the presence or absence of water is going to have a large impact on your electrical resistivity. So you need to do this rock physics step, not just below the water table, but above the water table. So this has now become our adopted way of doing the equivalent of our laboratory rock physics experiment. And we're doing this with every geophysical field method we're working with now, thinking about how we can work with the measurement itself and known information about that field site to do this link. So back to our subsidence bowl, what's causing the subsidence? So we bring in our airborne electromagnetic system. And the white lines that are coming up are flight lines that we laid out to cross this subsidence bowl. And what you're going to see are the electrical resistivity values coming up. It's going to be overlaying a Google Earth map, even though these values are actually below the ground surface. And the color scheme you see here, the purple is the bedrock of the Sierras, the blue are the clays immediately adjacent to the Sierras, orange and yellow, sand and gravel, green, means we've got sand and gravel interlayered with clay. So this is the type of data we can get with this airborne EM system. And I still am thrilled every time I look at these data sets. Like we are imaging to a depth in this study of about 350 meters below the ground surface. And when the water managers in this area looked at this, they were amazed. Like this is so far beyond the kind of resolution and understanding of large scale structure and small scale variability so far beyond what they could ever get from their well data. And in terms of the specific question we were trying to figure out here, why do we have subsidence over here, but not over here? What's happening is you are pumping from sands and gravels. So you need to be pumping. That pumping is reducing the head, the, the water level or the water pressure in these sands and gravels. These sands and gravels can't compact much, but the reduction of the head in these sands or the reduction of the water pressure in these sands and gravels serves to drain the clays. And it's this compaction of the clays that causes the subsidence. So the perfect storm in terms of subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley is the amount of pumping, but that finely interlayered clay. So there's lots of clay layers that are going to compact and add up to this surface subsidence that we see. So that's one example of using airborne EM data to look at an issue related to, excuse me, <coughs> issue related to water quantity in the Central Valley. We've also been using airborne EM data to look at water 
quality issues in, the, in California more generally. And I just want to show you the results we obtained from looking at saltwater intrusion along the Monterey coast. So this picture alone tells you why we have a problem with saltwater intrusion along the Monterey coast. Here we have extensive agriculture right up to the shoreline pumping of groundwater adjacent to the Pacific Ocean is just drawing the Pacific Ocean into the coastal groundwater system. And in this part of California, groundwater makes up in some of the counties along this coast over 90% of the fresh water supply. So it's continued pumping of the groundwater along here. So over decades, we've just had continued saltwater intrusion. And in order to address the issues associated with saltwater intrusion, we need to know where the saltwater intrusion is. And again, challenges working with limited well data. But when we acquired airborne EM data in this area, this is one of these is an example of the 3D model we were able to obtain of electrical resistivity, which here is primarily mapping out fresh water and salt water. Because it's so electrically conductive, we're only seeing to a depth of about 120 meters along the coastline. So this is the coast of Monterey Bay, and this is farther inland. And you can just see the bright red where we have salt water intruding into the shallow aquifer. And up here, we can see a deeper aquifer. And when we slice through this 3D model, we see this classic, this is this classic wedge of salt water coming in from the ocean and the overlying fresh water. So again, all these data are sitting on top of a Google Earth map, just so we know where we are. Here's the city of Marina, but it's electrical resistivity measurements to a depth. The maximum depth in this area was about 250 meters. Now, the contour you see at the base was the assumed distribution of salt water in the area based upon well data, but you can see the pattern is much more complicated than they were able to predict from the well data. And in this study, as we went to the north, we could see salt water penetrating far inland in the upper aquifer and also breaking through in places to the underlying aquifer. And this is either due to gaps in the clay layer that is assumed to separate the upper aquifer from the lower aquifer, or it could be due to just the way the wells have been completed in this area where people have drilled from the upper aquifer into the lower aquifer and haven't adequately sealed the wells. So we have over the last, oh, this started about five years ago, been accumulating fantastic demonstrations of how this geophysical method, airborne electromagnetics, can be used to reveal what is happening in these groundwater systems. And geophysics has there's been very little use of geophysics for groundwater science or groundwater management in California. And this is just alerting people to the fact that geophysics should play the same central role in groundwater that it has for so many years in the oil and gas industry as a way to assess the groundwater aquifers, to be an integral part of managing these aquifers. So while my interest uh, in using geophysical methods has always primarily been to advance our scientific understanding of our groundwater systems. For the past 15 years, I've been very motivated to see how that can be used to inform or support sustainable groundwater management. Because when you think of our groundwater supplies being depleted all over the world, you have to ask, how, how can we sustainably manage these systems? And how can we get the data we need to inform our management so that it's effective. So in 2014, one of the most exciting things that has happened in my research life was there was legislation, legislation passed by the California legislature and it was called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA. And it put in place this regulatory framework that said groundwater throughout California must be sustainably managed. How is sustainability defined in somewhat vague terms? They, they defined it in terms of things that can't happen. These are also called the six deadly sins of groundwater pumping. There cannot be chronic lowering of water levels. So these water levels going down, 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 down just can't happen. There can't be significant and unreasonable reduction of the amount of groundwater that's there. There can't be significant and unreasonable saltwater intrusion. 
We can't degrade water quality. There cannot be significant and unreasonable land subsidence. Now you notice that significant and unreasonable haven't been explicitly defined and that's a bit of a problem. But this is setting up, it's, it's just saying we, we have to stop. Business as usual can't keep going. So let's start sustainably managing our groundwater. So this was passed in 2014 and immediately there was an urgent need to understand groundwater systems. When you look at the groundwater basins in California and rank them in terms of priority, medium and high priority basins are basins where there is concern that they're not in balance. The water coming out is exceeding the water going in. They are on their way down. Well, 96% of California groundwater is classified as falling into those types of basins. The plan for those basins, high priority basins were due in 2020, although now there's been requests for extensions or 2022, which is just next January. And the idea is that groundwater sustainability will be achieved by 2040 or by 2014. So this is incredibly ambitious, but incredibly exciting, I think, that we're finally grappling with this problem. So where I became very involved in this issue was recognizing that the groundwater models that were going to be used to develop these groundwater management plans can only be as good as the data going into the models. And where are the data going to come from? We know that well data is useful data, but just inadequate in terms of spatial coverage. So in 2014, I said over four years ago, now I sent, I sent a white paper to the governor's office along with uh, Paul Goslin from a water agency and Graham Fogg at UC Davis. And we said, this is what you need. You need to acquire airborne electromagnetic data in 127 groundwater basins, these medium and high priority basins. It's going to cost you $10 million. It'll take two years. And when you look at this $10 million, you realize, it's only the cost of 60 monitoring wells. And that's typically the way groundwater models are developed is to put in a monitoring well that's continually monitoring the change in water levels and water pressure, and you use that to calibrate your model. Well, for $10 million, we could fly the state and get this big picture view of the subsurface. And so I'm delighted to say the Department of Water Resources came back and said, sounds intriguing, but how would we do this? Yes, we've got some small pilot studies now, but how would we even think of scaling this up to do this in groundwater basins throughout California? So what was launched was a project we called the Stanford Groundwater Architecture Project, The Gap. It just finished in October, 2020 after two years. And this was a pilot project. And our mission was to develop the optimal workflow for the acquisition of airborne EM data AEM data throughout California. Project leads listed there. This was a big collaboration with partners from Denmark, partners within California, members at Stanford and at Aarhus University on the research team, other collaborators listed here. And a critical part of this was we did this working closely with water agency partners. We teamed up with three water agencies, Butte and Glen County, San Luis Obispo, and Indian Wells Valley. And the funding came from some of the funding from the local agencies, Department of Water Resources, State Water Resources Control Board, the Danish EPA. So in whole, this ended up being a $2 million project over two years to partner with these three areas, acquire airborne EM data, and figure out exactly how to do, that. well, not exactly, never be exact, but to start mapping out the workflow for acquiring airborne EM data. And when I have to acknowledge extra funding from the Moore Foundation, which really allowed the Stanford group to go beyond the mandate of the GAP project and really use this as an opportunity to advance the state of the research, state of our understanding of applying these airborne EM methods. So you can read all about it at MapWater. So glad I got this website, mapwater.stanford.edu. And I'm just going to talk about another example of working with airborne EM data, which goes beyond those two initial studies I talked about, which was really, look at the amazing image we get. This is 
how do we work with these data and develop some sort of predictive capability, some ability to really inform groundwater modeling? So this is another phenomenal data set. Like once you've worked with a few airborne EM data sets, it's very easy to just get hooked on this form of geophysics. So here's the scale, 30 kilometers. This is in the northern part of the Central Valley, 45 kilometers here. And we're typically seeing to a depth. So again, this is our resistivity image overlaying the Google Earth map. And we're typically seeing to a depth of about 300 and 350, some places up to 400 meters. So we acquired, the GAP project was defined so that in each of our study areas, we acquired 800 kilometers of data. And someone said to me, how did you come up with 800 kilometers, which has now become a bit of a standard for these size surveys? And I said, it's because it converts easily to miles, because as you might have noticed, I struggle with going back and forth with miles and metrics, having lived in Canada for a long time, then the US. So I can easily do 800 kilometers, 500 miles. So that's how this great standard for acquisition of airborne EM data got set up. So here's the airborne EM data set. And Essential to the GAP workflow, something we said has to be first and foremost from the start is define the question. And, and this is a concept Adam Pidlasecki and I, when we started the groundwater um, Center for Groundwater Evaluation and Management at Stanford years ago, we said we are interested in decision aware geophysics. So I have to say as a geophysicist, give me a helicopter, give me an airborne EM system. I would just love to go out and acquire data and see what's there. But that's really not the best way to use geophysics to support groundwater science or groundwater management. And so here we said, you have to start by saying, what are the key groundwater management decisions that need to be addressed? And this step is actually more challenging than you might think. It involves a lot of back and forth with the water agency. What do you wanna know? Well, what can you tell us? Well, what do you wanna know? Well, what can you tell us? And, and there's one thing that's critically important about using geophysical methods to support groundwater management, something I care deeply about, and that is do not oversell or manage expectations. As a wonderful collaborator, Jim Canney always said, we don't want to set up geophysics as this solution to everything you need to know about your groundwater systems. So working with Butte, we decided that our problem definition was to obtain an improved delineation of the large scale structure of their aquifer system, their groundwater system, and to get some information about spatial heterogeneity. And they were most interested in understanding the connectivity between the upper part and the lower part. So right now there was a lot of pumping from the shallow part. What if people started pumping from the lower part? Would that impact the shallow part? Would it impact the Sacramento River? So one of the first things we explored in this project was doing the work required, doing the numerical analysis, the theoretical background work to clearly understand the limitations of the airborne EM method. And one of the things that became obvious early on is that most groundwater models are set up using stratigraphic or many cases referred to as hydrostratigraphic units. So things like up in Butte, the Tuscan Formation, the Tehama Formation, the Quaternary this, the Jurassic that. Well, Airborne EM doesn't care whether it's Quaternary, Jurassic, Tehama, Tuscan. So we had to very early on say, we're going to be coming up with very different kinds of models. And it turns out that's actually okay. In fact, in many ways, more useful than knowing Tuscan or Tehama. We said, what we can tell you is sand and gravel dominated, silt and clay dominated. So we're really mapping out the sediment types that are related to the hydraulic properties, porosity and hydraulic conductivity or permeability that you would be interested in. Another thing we had to make very clear early on is what we can detect with this method. And so this is just showing a 1D profile, how resistivity is varying with depth. And what you see, and it's a, it's a limitation of the airborne EM method, once it gets resistive, the difference between resistive and very resistive, you really can't tell the difference. This is the airborne EM response, looking at the measured voltage as a function of time. You really can't see even if I was to zoom in. So it's understanding that there are some 
you, some places where separating a sand and gravel from bedrock might be challenging if the resistivity values are very close. Another limitation, and this is really, really important, is how thick does a layer need to be at depth in order for me to be able to see it? And this, we did the modeling for the specific case of Butte and Glen County. And this is the thickness that a sand and gravel layer would need to be at this depth in order to pick it up. So this says, if I'm down 150 meters and there's a sand and gravel package and it's thinner than 10 meters, I'm never going to see it. There's higher sensitivity to the clays, which is useful because clays act as an impediment to flow. But by the time you're down 200 meters, five meter packages of clay, you're not going to see it. So this is the kind of background that sometimes we gloss over in our geophysics, but is in really, really important when you're trying to inform groundwater modeling in an area. Integrate with other sources of data. Well, in Butte and Glen County, we hit the jackpot, both in terms of collaborators and the data that were available. This is such a complicated plot, but it's just showing places where not only do we have wells co-located with the airborne EM data, they've got resistivity logs, they've got great lithology logs, they've got multi-level sampling of head levels. And so doing the background research and pulling together all the data you can is a huge part of it. And integration with other sources of data, as I've already, already said, is a big part of building the link between resistivity and what's there. So a big thing for me is communicating uncertainty. The last thing I want to do is give, here's my interpretation to a water agency. They build their groundwater model on it. They go out and put in their monitoring well, aiming for a sand target, and they hit clay. And there's no reason to deliver one answer anymore. We know how to think about where the uncertainty in the whole airborne EM workflow is, and we can quantify it. So one very well-known source of uncertainty is this concept called depth of investigation, which is shown as a dash line here. So even though I might show you the resistivity data, and this is resistivity data is the color. This is going down to a depth of about 500 meters below the ground surface along this 16 kilometer stretch. Even though I might show you the data down here, this dash line tells you that my sensitivity to resistivity below this line is not very good. So there's a high level of uncertainty once I get below that line. But we can do better than that because up here, it's uncertain too. There's no reason to believe with 100% confidence everything up here. So the typical airborne EM interpretation workflow was to take your well data, your airborne EM data through some inversion process and come up with a resistivity model. Here's my resistivity model transform it to sediment type, ta-da, here's my final map of what's in the subsurface. So what we're saying is, no, 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 this inversion process is so non-unique. You can invert this data set and recover one resistivity model. There's thousands of other resistivity models that would fit those data. So there's thousands of other sediment type models. And that is the process we're now advocating, is do these this full range of possible inversions and display not single answers, but probabilities and quantify uncertainty by capturing these probabilities. So a paper we've submitted to Water Resources Research, in fact, just came back for revision called, what we do there, we refer to it as exploring the model space. So instead of coming up with a single model, we came up with 6,000, 6,006, because there's six models, a thousand posterior samplings of each, but we dealt with 6,006 resistivity models, 6,006 sediment type models and derived information from those models. And just to show you an example of the four recovered models. So here's my rock physics transform. Everything gray is clay and silt in this resistivity range. Everything yellow is sand and gravel in this resistivity range. Here's my resistivity models and here's my sediment type model. Well, this first one, what we see, and I'm showing to a depth of 350 meters along this flight line, what we see is the yellow is sand and gravel, the gray is clay, the white line here is depth of investigation. And this is kind of 
good place to start. All it assumes is that properties in the subsurface are varying smoothly, but I don't use any prior knowledge. The second one says, let's set a reference model or the second approach. And in this one, I've said, if you're struggling and trying to figure out what to put there, reference the resistivity value of clay. And in the other one, I'm saying my background model, my possible reference model that you can be working towards has the resistivity values of sand. So what you immediately see is below the depth of investigation, here it all becomes clay, here it all becomes sand, and here it bounces around between clay and sand. So just to illustrate the point that what you're assuming in terms of your starting models have a huge impact on what you get. So what we decided to use because we had such high quality resistivity logs is an inversion result that we obtained by constraining the results to the resistivity logs. And so what do we do? How do we go from this to a large scale model of the aquifer system? Here's the result. This is showing this three dimensional section here, our three dimensional model, 50 kilometers long, 40 kilometers back into the page, 450 meters depth. This is the depth of investigation. But this is showing where we predominantly seen sand and gravel. And this is looking at the probability of there actually being sand and gravel there. So for a water manager, this is exactly what they want, the big picture predominantly sand and gravel, but the probability is allowing them to map out uncertainty. And so, oh, this is the large scale. So they defined an upper zone, high probability of sand and gravel, lower zone, high probability of sand and gravel, high probability of sand and gravel, and then the middle zone where there's a loss of connectivity. And we can estimate uncertainty throughout this entire model. So water managers know when they look at a specific area, the level of confidence in what's there. So integration with other sources of data is really important at the interpretation stage. Um, here, we particularly wanted to assess vertical connectivity. So what we did was took our airborne EM model and we wanna come up with a plan view of how does the amount of coarse grained material vary in plan view, because that's giving us information about the vertical connectivity. So we took this starting model, we integrated coarse fraction, my scribbles here, and came up with a plan view that's showing where we have primarily coarse material in red, where we have a lot of fine material in blue. And we were able to compare that to results from monitoring wells where we have multi-level sampling and the correlation between the hydraulic gradient, the connectivity that was interpreted based upon these monitoring wells showed very high correlation with what we were seeing in our airborne EM data. So that's an example of the sort of thing we can do with this workflow. We start out acquiring these amazing data we invert them in ways that truly recognize the non-inversion, the non-uniqueness of our inversion method. We get many models. We, we give the water managers or for interpreting, interpreting the functioning of this system, we estimate the best. And, and then we're able to give them some estimate of uncertainty. So where are we now? Um, four years after we proposed this, the state loved it. Everyone loves it. Everyone is very enthusiastic about airborne EM data. And so there's now a commitment, the data acquisition starting this summer to $12 million over four years for statewide acquisition of airborne EM data, very much as we laid out in the high and medium priority basins reconnaissance scale. So if anyone would like to spend the next four years, join me in processing, working with these data to create groundwater models, please do. So I just want to close with a, um, a higher resolution example of what we're doing with airborne EM data. So we've mapped out what's causing the subsidence. It's really the problem of we're pumping so much water and because of the geology, it's sinking. But what can we do with that information? And really the reason we have subsidence is that water out exceeds water in. 
So what can we do about that? Well, clearly nature needs help. Natural recharge is not keeping pace with the pumping that's going on there. And so there's a lot of interest now in California and presumably a lot of this is happening in Texas too, in managed recharge, where we look for opportunities to spread water on the ground surface. If we're lucky enough to have wet gears anymore, this is an empty recharge basin. And during the winter months, any excess surface water is diverted to this recharge basin to move into the subsurface. And farmers are now volunteering their fields to be flooded. But the critical question is, where are the optimal places for recharge? You don't wanna be flooding fields where there is a lot of clay immediately below the ground surface. That means that water ponds and you lose a lot of water through evaporation. You can also cause disease to the trees or the crops that grow there. You can also waterlog the soil and cause your expensive almond trees to be blown over. And so we're trying to use geophysical methods to figure out where are these sweet spots where we can put water on the surface and it gets down to these deeper zones of sand and gravel? We can do a certain amount with this scale of data, but what we've started working with is a better method, also out of the same Danish group that developed SkyTem. This is TOTEM. It's a towed electromagnetic method, and we just bought one last year, and we're about to use it for the first time next month. This was the um, test in California. It was shipped over from Denmark, put together in the field. It's towed behind an ATV. The physics is the same. Here's your transmitter loop. You're sending the current through, sets up a magnetic field. The receiver's behind, receiving the signal that comes back. And I had people with tape measures doing this 10 times before I paid $6,000 to fly this from Denmark. How big is this instrument? How wide is the spacing in this almond grove? And you can see this instrument is it's as if it was tailor-made for this problem. And so we drove up and down in this almond grove, figuring out if this is an optimal place for recharge. And we also worked in a recharge basin to understand if there were areas in this basin that were better than others in terms of infiltration. And my students were very impressed that I went out and drove this ATV, but it was worth it because the data we got back were amazing. And this is just showing the final result where we're able to go through very much the same workflow as we do with the Airborne EM. Here we're imaging to a depth of 80 meters as opposed to 400 meters, but we have much finer spatial resolution. The red is where we have coarse grained permeable zones where if you flood here, we're pretty sure we're going to get water down where we want it. So, I'm at 44 minutes and 45 seconds, according to my clock. And I was told I had 45 minutes. So I think I'm on time. And I've been talking about advancing the use of geophysical methods for imaging groundwater systems. I just want to finish as I often finish these days. When I'm talking to students, faculty, postdocs, there is an urgent need for sustainable groundwater management. Groundwater is essential, not just for humans, but for the whole functioning of the hydrologic cycle for the support of all of life on this planet. And the way we are depleting our groundwater resources, it just can't continue. So there's an urgent need for sustainable groundwater management when I'm talking to a group of geophysicists, but this extends to all our sciences. There's an incredible opportunity to get involved here. In fact, I should have changed this to um, all geoscientists. There's an incredible opportunity. The, the challenges are huge. The research is fascinating. But it's not just an incredible opportunity to work on this challenging problem with really amazing people. We also, I feel, have a collective responsibility. We know so much. And for so many of us, I started off in my graduate student days at Stanford working in a program that was focused on oil and gas and recognized that, hey, there's a real opportunity to move this geophysics into the hydro world. I feel we have a responsibility to take that we know to take what we know and use it to address this challenging problem. So additional acknowledgements, some were acknowledged throughout, but the students who've been involved, the postdocs, the research scientists, collaborators, funding. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. And there's a question in the chat. Yes, 
Hello, uh, everybody. I've, I've been tasked with um, the Q&A, but before I do the Q&A, I just really wanted to talk to thank Rosemary for such a great and insightful presentation, especially talking about geophysics. And as you know, I'm a geophysicist as well. <laughs> so I share your emotions and happiness with anything that we can use to probe the ground from afar. So thank you so much, uh, Rosemary. Now, we're open for questions if you want. Uh, I, can, I have a question, Carlos, to this talk. Yes, I can look at the chat or, uh, uh, Nicolas, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Knight, I don't want to seem like I'm giving excessive praise, but that was one of the, the best uh, seminars I have attended here at UT. It was a fantastic job, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so going out to the question, I think that uh, getting to know salt intrusion uh, directly from uh, these surveys is, is a direct answer because that's a low resistivity of the salty water and, and it's, it's a, I see the, the direct use right away. But for the depletion, uh, it's not that straightforward, right? And I was wondering in some of those maps that you showed at the beginning, if the reason for excessive uh, subsidence in that particular region was because in that particular region there was more uh, water pumping or because of the geological conditions in that place? That is a great question. And that is what we are developing right now, the hydromechanical model of that area. You need both is the short answer. You could pump forever, but if it was a carbonate aquifer or if it was only sand and gravel, you wouldn't get any subsidence. The bad news is your water levels would keep going down. But if you had complete clay, no one would be pumping there, so it wouldn't go anywhere. So it's kind of like this sweet spot, but not sweet, sour spot, where you have enough sand and gravel to make it a interesting or a desirable target for pumping. And you've got so much interlayered sand and clay. And fine interlayered sand and clay is actually a worse scenario than thick. Because if I have thick, this pressure has to diffuse through the clay in order to get it to collapse. And that's where there's a time lag that Ann Chen worked on when she was with us at Stanford. But these thin clays interspersed throughout the sand, that is the worst scenario because you have all this exposed, you know, it's this high surface area to volume ratio. You have all this exposed clay and you're changing the pressure around it. They just collapse when that pressure changes. So you need both. I, I see. Uh, that's also a very similar problem in highly bearing sediments. The, 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 the worst scenario is when you have those sands also interbedded with uh, soft mud rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos, can I ask a question quick? Yes, please go ahead, Larry. Uh, we did a little work with INSTAR a few years back, and you can see uh, subsidence, actually, inflation over uh, oil, oil fields. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, one of the fields is in the central basin is the Lost Creek field. It's a really nice up and down uh, there. And uh, does does the presence of, and there is a fair amount of production in the central basin. Does that kind of compromise your your conclusions? Um, so we have specifically not been working in areas where there is depletion of Anne looked at this for a few months when she was at Stanford, how oil and gas extraction is going to impact the INSAR signal. So we've been working in places where there's not oil and gas extraction, but if there is, definitely you get subsidence associated with that. And then a second question is, oh, no, and I like, I like, sorry, I like your One specific question because Anne looked at it, is in many of these fields, and I'm not enough of a petroleum engineer, but instead of letting the pressure drop, you're also injecting to keep the pressure up. You so bet. if you're pulling oil and gas out, if you're putting other stuff in to keep, as long as the pressure stays high, you don't get subsidence. Yeah, and and this is a more a more broad-based question. I like your six rules or whatever it is, but it yeah, seems like every, everything points to using less groundwater. Uh, it does. Uh, your, your, and is, is that viable considering how much of agriculture is in the central ba uh, basin? Well, I was in a meeting recently and someone said the only sustainable solution to the San Joaquin Valley is to get out of agriculture. And I said, well, where does the food supply for California? You know, it's one of yeah. these perfect storms and now oh, you fly it in. Yeah, well, that's great for climate. You know, so 
I think I put a lot of hope in recharge and not just recharge of excess surface water, but recharge of recycled water. So looking at recycled water use and use for recharge, I mean, but that comes down to adequate treatment. And people are very concerned because every time we think we've figured out these great treatment methods that deal with all this, then you discover there's one more thing they found that's making it through the treatment. And um, so recharge is a huge focus right now in California because I think I read something, some, there was a storm over, I don't know, for a day or something in Los Angeles. And if they cat, caught that water instead of it heading through the cemented Los Angeles Valley out to sea, it would have provided water for, I can't even remember the number, but capturing flood. You know, and in California, the joke is that there's always been a levy between the flood water management group and the ag water management group. And now they're actually talking to each other to take that flood water and use it for recharge. So there's so much interest right now in using geophysics to identify recharge locations. And I'm on the bandwagon of talking about zoning for recharge. I don't think anyone should be allowed to put a development. You cannot pave what is the critical recharge location when it rains here is my latest political bandwagon. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rosemary, very good. Thank you, don't try that in Texas. I, we, we can talk about that. <laughs> but but uh, we want the questions from students. So where are the students? There is a question in the chat actually on the same subject of recharge, if you'd like to read it. Or I can read it yeah. for you. I can see very, uh, well, very good and important it. subject. Thank you. Do you have any 4D data pre post recharge work it, it, uh, through time series? So that's a great question. And that's what we were trying to do. And so I talked about SkyTem and I talked about TOTEM. Two years ago, we did a pilot called Drone Tem because the trouble with doing time lapse is getting access to the field while the recharge is occurring. And some people at Lawrence Berkeley Lab have laid out electrodes and we worked in a recharge pond along the California coast and had electrodes buried beneath a pond to watch it throughout a season. In these almond groves, we'd love to do that too, but you can't drive like the surface of almond groves is so perfectly leveled so that the irrigation water doesn't pond. So the idea of putting water there and us driving through would never happen. So we laid this large, this is a small company in Japan whose name I'm blanking on. The transmitter loop circled the almond grove. Then we had a drone carrying the receiver and we're still working on those data. They're still working on the technology, but I think that is what's going to be fantastic. Anybody else, more students? More questions from students? I was. If nobody wants to, I have a few questions. You talked about drones. If you were to use the drone technology right now and fly over those fields, what would be the best depth of investigation that you would achieve? So with the drone that we used, I think we were limited to about 30 meters. Whereas with the ground-based system, we were going to 80. And I think, you know, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to remember what the problem was. Yeah, sorry, Carlos, I can't remember the details of that survey. It wasn't, the, I had this vision that this is going to be amazing. Here comes that science publication. No, it's a lot of work. We're trying to figure out what went wrong with parts of the processing stream. And, and they're working a lot on a lot of signal to noise issues. Okay. All right, and with that, um, we're going to go ahead and head over to those individual mini sessions. So if you signed up for those, you should have a link in your inbox. I see some students are already waiting in those rooms. So um, thank you all grad students and faculty for uh, making it. And yeah, we'll see everyone else over in the mini sessions. And, um, and thank you so much, uh, Rosemary. Thank you so, so very much. It was thank a great you. talk. Excellent talk. Thank you. you. In little group. Thank you. Rosemary, I'll see you in the mini group. In the mini group. <laughs>